Hey, how you doing? Justin here, back with some major scale maestro course for you. We're in unit seven. This is part B. If you're following the course along, maybe you've stumbled upon this lesson independently. We're going to be looking at doing string bending within the major scale. It ain't just a blues thing. A lot of people see the string bending as being like, yeah, if I'm going to do the blues. <laughs> That's, that's where the string bending is going to come in. But it's just as useful. In fact, it's potentially more beautiful in a major scale context. But there's some really, really important things to remember that if you don't do it, it's just going to sound really awful. Now, when you do a string bend, you're bending one note to the pitch of another note. It's not just an arbitrary amount where you just do a bend however far you feel like it on that moment. I mean that there are times that that can kind of work if you want things to be deliberately a bit crunchy. But in the major scale, generally speaking, you're going to be bending one note to another note. So when you're doing string bends within the major scale, it's really important that you know what the note is that you're bending to. Okay, this is a really, 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 really important thing because if you bend the note wrong in the major scale, it sounds really sour. If you get if you bend a semitone instead of a tone. So every time you go to bend a note within the major scale, you need to know if the note that you're bending needs to bend a semitone or a tone to get to the next scale degree. Now, generally speaking, we do string bends on the thinner three strings. You can do it on the thicker strings, but to start off with, I would recommend that you focus your attention on the thinnest three strings of each pattern, one at a time, and learn how far you're going to bend the top note of each of those patterns. If you do it that way, then you'll eventually learn where all of the notes are that you can possibly bend. But just as a good starting point, just have a look at that top note of each of the patterns, because that's the one that might not be immediately obvious how far you need to bend it. Let's take a look a pattern one and get an idea of what I mean. So here's pattern one, the major scale, something you should be very familiar with at this point. Now, generally speaking, we don't do bends with a little finger, so you're probably already going to have to think in terms of using different fingering, which you should be confident with using single fingers or whatever finger you want on those major scales anyway. But let's say we've landed on this note and we're thinking about doing a string bend. In pattern one, it's not immediately obvious what the next note is of the scale. If you look in pattern two, you can see that that next note is a tone higher. So if you're going to bend that note in pattern one, it needs to be a tone bend, this note. If you're struggling to do your bends in tune exactly, you need to do some more practice with your string bending. This is the exercise anyways. Play a note, play the note you want to bend it to, and then do the bend. Get used to what it feels like. Now what about this second string here? So we're playing the major scale and we ended up on that note and we want to do a string bend. Again, check it here. Ah, oh, it's another tone. So tone. That's a tone bend there. What about this note if you stumbled on that one? Oh, it's another tone. The thinnest three strings, the furthest up, are all going to take a tone bend. But the other real common one, the common ones to bend in pattern one, is these two notes here, which are already with your third finger. But if you're going to bend that note, how far are you going to bend it? There's the next scale degree. So it's just going to take a little bend there. If you try and bend that a tone, it's going to sound all kinds of sour. So you, you're bending that note to that note. Okay, same here. That one. Now if you're going to bend that fourth string to that one, that's the root note. If you bend that one a tone to here, to the G sharp, that is going to sound real sour. Okay, so you really want to be aware here, if you're ending up on that note in pattern one, tone bend, tone bend, this one, tone bend here, semitone, here a semitone. 
So that's what I would call mapping, making sure that you know what notes are going to bend how far. That would be part one of your practice is figuring that out in each pattern one at a time. Again, wouldn't recommend that you just jump in and start trying to do it to all of the major scale patterns at once. Start in pattern one, which you should be very, very familiar with by now, and then have a go at actually improvising, focusing on doing string bending and making sure it's in tune. Now, you're best off doing this with a backing track or a looper pedal or someone else because just on your own, it's very hard to tell if you're always getting it, the notes right. As soon as you play it with a backing track, if you bend the wrong amount, it's going to sound really sour. So it'll be very, oh, hang on, that wasn't right. I didn't bend that the right amount. And that's what you want when you're doing the practice. So once you feel confident playing within pattern one and you've mapped the notes and you know what notes are going to bend so far, then maybe have a go at looking at pattern two and see which notes you might want to bend in pattern two and how far you're going to bend them, then put it into practice. Don't skip the putting it into practice bit. The mapping's not going to do any good if you just do that and leave it as an intellectual exercise. You need to do that part first, then you need to put it into practice in an improvisation. It's really, really a key thing here. Uh, a great example of a major scale song with string bending, actually Wonderful Tonight by Eric Clapton. It's a nice one if you're looking for an actual song to put it in. You can improvise within the key of G major all of the way through that. Uh, I'm sure Eric won't mind if you just jam along over the top of his original recording or you can find a backing track or want to use one of the many backing tracks so I got available over on justaguitar.com to go and check it out if you haven't already. Another thing that you'll probably find pretty helpful is downloading that PDF worksheet over on the website, which will show you all of the different scale patterns and show you the complete map of the whole neck so you can very easily see which notes are going to have to bend so far. Now for a little bit of good news here at the end, it might seem a little bit overly complicated doing all this mapping and deliberately practicing your tone and semitone bends. I think it's important to do that, but after you've done a bit of practice on it, you'll start to find that your ear will guide you. Your musical imagination will soon let you know whether a note has to bend or a tone or a semitone. It will take some practice. That it, it won't gift that to you straight away by just learning the map. You need to do some practice in pattern one, but probably if you've done good, I don't know, 20 practice sessions, 25 minute practice sessions on pattern one doing the string bending, when you come up to pattern two, your ear will probably guide you pretty well. You'll start to just go to bend a note and your ear will let you know, is it a tone or a semitone bend? If you bend a semitone, but it should be a tone, it's relatively easy just to keep bending and get it up to that right note. If you overbend, it can be a little bit wonky sounding. If you bend a tone and realize it's wrong and then you have to drop it a semitone, like relax some of that bend. That doesn't usually sound so good, but again, hopefully your ear will tell you straight away like, oh yeah, well, you've bent it enough, stop there, right? You, you, again, you won't be thinking about it. It won't be talking to you. You'll just naturally, hopefully, get find yourself playing more and more of the right notes the more you practice it. Okay, it's time to talk about your practice routine for Unit 7 on the Major Scale Maestro course. The same thing that we had for Unit 6. We're going to have two five-minute sessions on Day 1 and a different two five-minute sessions on Day 2, and you alternate between them. The first one is going to be working on your melodic sequences, so working on your four in a line, three in a line, reverse four, maybe working on your thirds as well, just to keep them nice and fresh. Only in pattern one to start off with, make sure you get super confident with all of those patterns in, uh, with all of those sequences in pattern one before you start applying it to other scale patterns. It really does make a big difference. If you get it right in one scale pattern, it's a lot easier to move it around to the different patterns afterwards. But give it a good, probably a few weeks 
on just major scale pattern one using all of the different se melodic sequences you've done so far. Then the second part of the practice that you'd still do on the first day would be a five minutes of improvising either with a backing track or a looper pedal or a jam buddy using the melodic sequences. So trying to jam them in a little bit, not the whole pattern, that'll sound weird, but just try and take like little sections of one of the patterns that you like, a little part that feels nice under the fingers and deliberately use it in an improvisation. If you improvisation, that sounded funny, but you know what I mean. So it, it, it's going to feel weird to deliberately try and force those kind of things in, but that's the way to get them from an exercise, which is like just a technical exercise, to actually being something you're going to use, is to deliberately wedge it in to start off with. It won't take long before you find the way to use them in a real kind of an honest uh uh, instinctive kind of a way but uh, to start off with most people need to kind of force it in so five minute improvising but trying to force in some sections of melodic sequence that would be day one the alternating days is going to be spending two five minute sessions on the string bending the first five minute session should be on the mapping so making sure you know what notes should bend and how far maybe doing a little bit of practice on that just doing this idea of playing the note <laughs> and then just do it playing the note you're bending to just like that just making sure that you're absolutely familiar with the major scale and what notes will bend how far and then you want to be doing some improvising for five minutes again focusing on using the string bending so I'm not saying again when you improvise for real that you would do it that way but to practice it you want to practice deliberately doing as much string bending in your improvisation as you can you need to either use a backing track you can do it in the key of G you could change the key it doesn't really matter what key you're doing it at this stage of your journey you should be you know getting used to it exploring keys other than G although nothing wrong with starting in G particularly if you want to do you know use a backing track like you could use Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd or Wonderful Tonight by Eric Clapton or Heart of God by Neil Young whatever there's lots of songs in the key of G you could use as a backing track or you could use one of the backing tracks you find over on justaguitar.com that would work or you could use a looper pedal and make your own backing track or the best of all is to find somebody to jam with so they can be working on their rhythm skills and they're playing the chords and their bar chords or whatever and you can practice improvising jam buddies are always the best way to practice your improvising if you can so really really pay attention to making sure that you get your notes in tune when you're improvising don't forget all of that important stuff like using space motive development uh you know thinking about your dynamics leaving space all of those things that we've talked about so far in this course still apply just because you're working on your string bending doesn't mean you should forget about them so try and mix all of that sort of stuff together and make yourself a super tasty solo using the string bending it's loads of fun i think it's once you incorporate string bending into the major scale it starts to it feels a little different, especially the fingering's going to have to change often. You'll be, you'll feel less restricted to have to use your little finger because most of the time string bending is done with the third finger. So it can really help you break out of those boxes as well. Again, I would recommend staying in pattern one and getting really familiar with that before you move into pattern two. But once you move into pattern two, see what you can come up with. You know, get the bending mixed in with the major scale. Make sure you do some mapping so you know how far to bend each one. Eventually, you want to be moving fluently through patterns one, two, three, and four and using string bending wherever you like. It's a real opener when you get used to string bending and sliding and hammer-ons and flick-offs. You've got all of these tools that you can use now in your major scale improvising. And hopefully you're having loads of fun with it. I'll see you for plenty more very soon, but only when you finish this module, right? Don't, don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry to jump onto the next one and learn a new pattern. Don't do that really get the, the each of the skills that we do in this course you really want to take your time make sure you've got it well under your fingers before you move on but when you're ready i'll be there waiting for some more fun stuff to explore on your major scale journey take care of yourselves bye-bye